Hey, you're listening to Sound Plus Doctrine, the podcast of Sovereign Grace Music. Sovereign Grace Music exists to produce Christ-exalting songs and training for local churches from local churches. For more information and free resources, you can check out SovereignGraceMusic.org. Thanks for joining us. Hey, welcome back to Sound Plus Doctrine. Hi, I'm yes. David Zimmer. I'm Bob Coughlin. And we have Devin with us. We're on part two of uh, Shepherding Souls Through De- Songs. Devin Coughlin, just in case, first in time case anybody's listening. wondering, and yeah. I'm glad you guys, I'm glad I passed. <laughs> into like, episode two? Yeah, I passed into episode two. I made it. <laughs> we had so a meeting great. outside of this. Uh, and we thought, yeah, let's let him come back. Yeah. Yeah. Here we are. It's great. What are, what are we, we're talking about part two. We are talking yes. about part two. Part two. So last time we talked about um, just the concept of shepherding souls through song, like that leading music in a church is more than picking songs you like, picking songs people like, mm-hmm. preparing for the sermon. It's, it's an act, an extension of the pastoral ministry that God has assigned to pastors in the church. Mm-hmm. You don't have to be a pastor to lead, but you want to have pastoral... Uh, impulses. Mm-hmm. And if you're looking for someone to lead in your church, that's a significant part of what you should be looking for, someone who has that heart to care for God's people. Right. So we look at five ways in the New Testament that, that God has, five roles that God has given to pastors to, to uh, care for the flock, to feed, to lead, care for, um, protect, and be an example to. So mm-hmm. we're going to start I don't know how far we'll get today, uh, but just talking about how songs help us feed the flock, mm. how songs help us teach, basically. So I thought I'd just start with Colossians 3.16, mm. you know, where Paul is in the midst of talking about how to live a Christ-honoring life, a gospel-centered life in the midst of a pagan culture, and he, he just jumps into music kind of out of the blue in verse 16. Mm-hmm. He's talking about how we're to you know, live with one another, live in harmony, live in peace, forgiving each other, uh, clothing ourselves with compassion, um, kindness, humility, patience. And then he says in verse 16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, giving, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Mm. That little phrase, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, mm. that's, that's significant. It, it ultimately means that we're to let the gospel dwell in us as we sing, mm. uh, that that is to fuel and to fill the, the songs that we sing. But it's the word of God that points to the word of Christ. So we are seeking to teach and admonish one another mm. as we sing. So someone said one time, we are what we sing. I think that was in, a, in an article I read years ago. Uh, Gordon Fee says, uh, you know, show me... A, show a church me, of songs. Church of songs will show you their theology. Mm-hmm. We can't find the source of that quote, the origin, but we're pretty <laughs> sure he said it. And Gordon, if you're listening, let us know if you happen to know where that's from. <laughs> Um, so it's not, you know, we think that it's preaching that feeds the flock, and it mm. is. That's the primary way God has given for the mm. church to be equipped through the teaching of the, you know, expositing the Word of God. But when we sing, we do that as well. Yeah. I mean, God tells us that's All that what we, we do doing. when we gather. We uh, go ahead, jump on that. Function to feeding. Yeah. Function mm. in feeding. The flock of God. That's all I wanted to add. I didn't want to add very much. <laughs> Just saying, I mean, I think that that's the one of the priorities of the gathering of God's people. Yeah. So, we, you know, think about the way we normally think about singing. I think it's usually an emotional response that we think of. You know, this song makes me feel happy. Mm. This song makes me feel good. This song right. makes me feel sad. This, you know, whatever. And we bring that into the church and... It's not a good thing, necessarily. Um, I mean, music is designed, God designed music to affect our emotions, but if that's the, the main reason we're listening to music or we're singing music, that's not God's primary intention for it. Mm-hmm. It's, it's that music be used as a tool, as a means, as a vehicle for helping us understand uh, God to helping us understand who we are, to helping us remember what Jesus has done, to help us understand our world. All mm-hmm. those things are to be done in the context of music. 
So it really changes the way you think about the songs yeah. that you sing. Yeah. You know, if you if you lead the songs, if you pick them, if you choose them, that's going to make a difference mm-hmm. uh, in terms of why you pick something. It means that words are preeminent. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. They're not secondary. Uh, and we've, you know, talk, oh, many conversations about, you know, the words of the songs we sing. They really matter. I mean, people remember the songs we sing much better than we remember the sermons. Mm. You know, if it, you can be sitting there on a Sunday afternoon and, and ask the people you're with, you know, hey, what do you remember from the sermon? And they might... You remember a couple points, hopefully, um, but by Wednesday, you know, maybe not. Certainly, my next week, you know, the following Sunday, a lot of people don't even remember what we talked about last Sunday, mm-hmm. but they remember the songs. Mm. You know, uh, we can remember songs, and that's God designed it that way. Mm. In Deuteronomy 31, when when Israel was about to enter the Promised Land, um, God was telling Moses. To, that the people were about to deny him and and follow idols after they got into the promised land. Mm. And he says, teach them this song because it will live uh, unforgotten in the mouths of their children. Wow. Yeah. The, the song will help them remember. And that's, I mean, that's one of the characteristics of music. It, it helps us get the words into our heads and into our hearts. Mm-hmm. And so it's crucial that we, we consider, you know, like, is our congregation getting the right diet mm. theologically through our mm. songs. If someone was to get their knowledge of God from the songs we sing over a year, right? how yep. well would they know him? How much would they right. know, of, know of him? You know, we expect the preaching to do that, but the song should be doing it too. Yeah. And I think, again, I mean, it highlights the, the, the fact that we have, to, we have to understand that singing is formational. Singing mm. does yes. shape yes. us. It shapes our affections, it shapes our theology. And, uh, and, and once we grasp that, then yeah, what, what we sing matters. Singing becomes more a matter of um, being governed by the Word of God and reciting who He has revealed Himself to be mm. um, than it does of uh, expressing what we want to think about well, God. Yes, yes. Um, or what makes yeah. us feel best about yeah, the God we believe saying, in. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that's, yeah, that's just, it's, it's such a powerful medium. I mean, so you can have people, the way our brains function, God has made our brains to function, word joined to melody has far more of an effect mm. than word on its own. Yeah. And yeah. so God has given us this gift. I love uh, Calvin in his, his forward to the Psalter um, that he put together. Uh, it's a, uh, he, he <clears throat> spends an extended time talking about the, the power of music, the of melody, he, he recognizes what he calls a secret power that mm. <laughs> the two parts of music, words and melody, uh, exercise when they're joined together. And he writes this, he says, it's true that all evil, all evil speaking perverts good morals, but when melody accompanies it, <laughs> it pierces the heart much more strongly and so enters inside of it. Wow. Therefore, it's all the more necessary to have songs not only honorable, but also holy that have the effect of encouraging the church to pray and praise God, to meditate on his works in order to love him, fear, honor, and glorify him. Mm. That's so good. That's <laughs> Calvin. Yeah, that's wow. Calvin. <laughs> Wouldn't normally expect that coming from John. <laughs> yeah, so that that makes me think of, you know, when we approach singing in the church as like, how is it going to make me feel? It mm. really doesn't matter so much what the words are saying. Mm. Because I just want to, I just want it to make me feel good, which is how we get bad words or vague words set to great tunes, mm-hmm. great right. melodies, right. because it just makes us feel good. That's not the ultimate goal. Mm-hmm. Now, if we're singing the truth about Christ and singing it with comprehension, it will make us feel good. Yeah, but not in the sense. The, the first way I was talking about, because mm-hmm. that would be more an emotional response. Yep. The second is more talking to our affections, mm. which, you know, emotions are what we feel, affections are why we feel it. Mm-hmm. So when your songs are addressing affections, it's it, they're speaking to, well, this is who God really is. Mm. This is what Jesus has really done. This is, this is the proper response to him. So it means that, you know, if we're really taking this seriously, and I thought... I, you know, been challenged by this numerous times as I look over like our repertoire 
over the years, are we singing songs about God's holiness and mm. judgment mm. and justice? Sean O'Donnell had a book uh, years ago called God's Lyrics, he wrote a book mm. years ago, and uh, it, it, it went through the songs of the Bible and just referenced how many times you know, they talk of God's judgment of sin. Mm. And there's a purpose to that. The, the purpose is that even when we're brought to God through Christ, God's still holy. He still hates sin. And so for the Christian, that's a sanctifying, that's a means of sanctification, you know, reminding ourselves God is holy. But for any unbelievers who are present, it's, it can be a means of convicting them. Like, mm. oh no, God is holy. Jesus is coming back to judge the earth, mm. to judge sin. And those who have not trusted in Christ will experience eternal torment, separation from God. Mm. That's something we need to sing about. Not every song, but yeah. it needs to be there. If we're going to have a theologically balanced diet in our songs, there needs to be song. There need to be songs that where we are referencing God's right. righteousness, His justice, His wrath, His holiness, so that. The word of Christ can dwell on us richly, right. because when we see right. the wrath o that we were under because of our conscious, willing, intentional rebellion against God, oh man, the mercy of God becomes so much sweeter. Yeah, the fact that Jesus would live a perfect life so He could die as our substitute, mm. taking our sins upon Himself, so that we could be forgiven and know God—that's like amazing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But you have to. You have to explore the, you know, all of who God is for that to be really meaningful. Yeah, it's got to be our singing yeah. must be governed by the Word of God, not by the God that we want to be singing about, mm. Uh, mm. but God as He's revealed Himself to be, um, and that's that's far more uh, uh, incomprehensible to us and far broader uh, than what any of us could come up on our own. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Um, I mean, it, the the God that we make in our own image in one sense is is a, a pathetic imitation. Oh, he's like us. Mm. Yeah, pathetic <laughs> imitation of the true God. Yeah. And uh and so and the only way we can do that is to really be be ruled by God's word yeah. and to, and to right. get God's word deep in our hearts through the songs that we sing. Mm. Right. Um and so whether you're choosing the songs or writing songs for the church, uh, that's what that's the that's the framework that we have to have yeah. for if the word of Christ is going to dwell in us richly. Yeah. And I would stress that this is <clears throat> something that we're aiming at. I mean, I'm always mm -hmm. reforming you know, yep. the songs we sing. There yep. may be, you know, I'll look at our, our songs, that, yeah, we don't have enough about this topic. Yeah, we don't have enough yeah. about this. Yeah. And, you know, realize, oh, I mean, a few years ago, we did an album called Sooner Count the Stars, um, something about the triune God, I forget the subtitle, but it was the songs, Trinitarian songs, because I don't think many of us are consciously trinitarian in the songs we sing hmm. not that every song has to be three verses you know father son spirit but right, right. just that we're speaking about god the way the new testament does mm. so there's a verse in second thessalonians 2 i think 16 where it says now may our lord jesus christ himself and god our father who loved us and gave et gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace and i thought why does, why does Paul do that? May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just, it's just kind of part of the fabric of the New yeah, Testament yeah. That, we're, that we're seeing God, we're, we're singing to him, we're praying to him as Father and Son, primarily Father and Son through the power of the Spirit. Spirit is not addressed very much in the New Testament, um, but he's God. Yeah. The three persons, one God. Do our songs reflect that? That we are exalting the Son by the power of the Spirit for the glory of the Father. Mm. Well, if we're aware of that lack, it's going to affect the, the the songs we choose to sing. Yeah, one scholar, Lester Ruth, he uh, recently did did a study of of the top CCLI songs over I think it was over twenty year period, mm. and so it kind of came up with what the what the top I think what songs were in the top twenty maybe over that time came up with one hundred and twelve different songs and found that of those songs only four percent of them mention. Father, Son, and Spirit. Wow, and uh, and then he's he makes the point, uh, which is is a an important point to make that if if the songs that we sing fail to speak accurately of God as He reveals Himself to yeah. be, and that is at His 
as triune, uh, then we end up with a very different faith and a very different God than the God of the Bible. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, we're always, we always want to be evaluating what, what kind of God do we present through mm. the songs that we sing. Um, mm. And it's a, uh, yeah, that's just something we're always, because, because our songs teach. Yeah. And our songs are going to shape people. Yeah, and ultimately, I say that, I think I said that recently, um, I would say primarily, you know, what our songs are meant to be doing is enabling the word of Christ mm -hmm. to dwell in people richly, which is why, you know, whether it's through a gospel arc, you know, mm -hmm. that you're taking your meeting through, God is holy, we're sinful, God's provided a way of, of being forgiven through Christ, and we respond to that. Um, or whether it's through specifically referencing who Jesus is and what he did exactly on the cross. Mm -hmm. So that that's you know a distinction that we don't often see, I don't think. Um, you know, a song like uh, um, the Isaac Watts tune, um, da, 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 da. When I Survey the Wonders Cross. Yes. Um, man, whoo, <laughs> <getting old. laughs> um, it's, it's this powerful song about the mm -hmm. cross. And one of the, you know, some people call it the greatest hymn in the English language. It doesn't tell what Jesus did. Mm. It just says that he hung on the cross, mm. he died, his blood flowed down. Has there ever been love like this? Love like this, you know, demands my soul, my life, my all. But it doesn't articulate what, say, in Christ alone yeah. does. Mm. And on the cross, as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. Mm. That is fact. Yeah. That is objective mm. truth that mm. enables mm. the word of Christ to dwell in people richly. And that's that's something we need to be looking at. Again, if you're responsible for planning or leading the songs, that you need to be looking for songs that say that. And of course, I mean in Sovereign Grace Music, that's we 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 have a burden for that. You know, if you're gonna yeah. write a song that's gonna be sung somewhere, sometime, why not try to include you know the the heart of the gospel, Jesus' substitutionary sacrifice for us, and all it implies. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't just keep singing about that over and over and over and over, but we talk about the implications of that, what it means, how it affects our lives, and that's a part of feeding the flock. Yeah, and I feel like uh, I feel like a lot of people. I mean, if you look at YouTube or Instagram or whatever, a lot of people are singing about Jesus. They're mm -hmm. gathering in large crowds to sing yeah. about Jesus, but I feel like um, it's the the pattern seems to be we're just responding to this one area, yeah, yeah you yeah. know, this one point, yeah. and we just keep rehearsing that. And so, how do you make the for someone who you know loves to be a part of those worshipful uh, you know events, or those Moments. are the songs that they sing at their church? Yeah, yeah. What would you say to someone that's saying you're missing such a a bigger view of the work of God what he's done his holiness the the trinity to someone who thinks well those might be like really dense topics when i yeah, just want to yeah, experience yeah. you know i just want to just kind of sit in this like responsiveness of yeah. what he's done the joy of the party of the gathering yes. like so how do, how what would you say to someone um that would find those hymns or those kind of songs too dense or yes. too thick Great question. Uh, can I jump in on that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, first, I think when we are are only thinking about what we do when we gather in terms of response, then all of the activity is on us, huh, yeah. uh, and that really flips on its head uh, what I think a biblical conception of Christian worship is, mm. is in the church is meant to be, mm. um, and certainly that's a part of it. Uh, but it's it's um, it, it if it's only response, it almost functions as as a high that we're just always pursuing, uh, mm. and we become just addicts, and and so it's just just give me the response. Mm. Um, the worship adrenaline high. Yeah, and uh, mm. if if so, if worship is only about our our responding, mm -hmm. uh, we eventually run out of things to respond to in one sense. Mm. Um, but worship begins with God's revelation. Mm. And it begins with what with what God wants to do as we gather together. Mm. And if we are so if we if we push back on 
objective truth and prioritizing objective truth in our gatherings, what we're pushing back on in one sense is God taking the, initi- the initiative yeah. in mm-hmm. our gatherings. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's where that's where the church's worship must begin, mm-hmm. um, in, in God's service, God's revelation to his people. Mm-hmm. And because God is, and this is where, again, I'm getting back to the, the Trinitarian priority of corporate worship, because God is triune, because he has this f- fellowship within himself, he is a, he is a communicative God. And that, that communication that he has within himself, that fellowship that he has between Father, Son, and Spirit, that pours forth hmm. to us. Yes, hmm. yes. And we get to participate in and enjoy in. that. We're invited in that through Christ by the power of the Spirit uh, to be able to, to enjoy that and participate hmm. in that hmm. um, and, and really respond to the goodness of that. Hmm. And so if we miss that... Hmm. Then we're just, I mean, it's like trying to uh, live on a diet of um, dessert. Hmm. I mean, where it's just, it's kind of like, it's just Which always. In some ways sounds appealing. It, but... It, but it makes you sick. <laughs> it does. That's hmm. right. It does. Over time, it makes you sick and your yeah. muscles atrophy hmm. and you your gut will be bloated and eventually you will die yeah. hmm. from malnutrition. Hmm. Um, and I think that's where uh, we can be in danger of going hmm. if it's all. On us, yes, and yes. our action and what we mm. do. Yeah, I would just describe that as you you start to worship your worship, mm. you start to be passionate about your passion. Oh, yeah, and that's it. Just dries up uh, because, or as you know, you were saying, you run out of things to talk about. Well, you run out of true things to respond to because it's all about your response, and you're just trying to produce that again. Right, right. Um, in Another thing I'd, I'd say is that don't wouldn't want people to understand and answer your question. Wouldn't want people to think that you know we're just talking about or the Bible is just talking about singing weighty, yep. heavy songs. But our songs teach us how to relate to God. Yeah. So if you have shallow, repetitive songs, if that's all you sing, it can communicate that you know God's God's easy to know and He's a lot like us. Like he never yeah. gets very deep, he just kind of functions at our level. Right. But if you sing, if all you ever sing is doctrinally thick, difficult songs, that can communicate that God is only interested in relating to highly educated people. Well, yeah, or, or he's, he's distant in, he's and inaccessible. Yeah, yeah, he's inaccessible, yeah. If you only sing emotionally driven songs, songs that just, they're always charged up, you know, I'll look at YouTube sometime, the different... Worship events and whatever, and it's just this. They're always so excited, you know. I thought my church isn't like that. I mean, we get excited, but <laughs> it's just not always up here. But mm. if that's all you ever do is sing mm. emotionally mm. driven songs, that can tend to teach us that God is primarily interested in our feelings and not so much in our minds mm. or our hearts or our hearts. Mm. More importantly, and then mm. if you sing, on the other hand, emotionally dry songs that never allow for expression, that can teach us that God really isn't interested in what we feel and desire. (laughs) And as J.K. Smith has written so well in You Are What You Love, and some other books, uh, that's my favorite, Um, James K. Smith, Jamie Smith. Yeah, yeah, Jamie Smith. Um, What you desire is crucial. Mm. And you can sing all the right things, Mm. but if your desires are going in another direction, you haven't changed at all. Mm. So so it's really important that we sing songs that balance this, you know, objective truths about God right. with the proper response about mm. right. to him. Right. It's not just a party. Right. You know, we're not just right. or we're not just getting together to have some, you know, emotional pinnacle. Um, that mm. might happen. I mean I've in corporate worship, there have been numerous times I've been undone. I have been unable to sing because of the reality of, of what I was singing. I remember mm-hmm. one time when we were in the Philippines, and I was with Devin. We were singing the song Grace Alone. And I was an orphan lost at the call, running away when I heard you call, but, but Father, you worked your will. Mm-hmm. And I remembered my conversion, and I just broke. I, I couldn't sing. I, you know, the, I encountered the Lord. It was mm-hmm. wonderful through the truth of election, you mm-hmm. know. And but that's not happening every time. Mm-hmm. What I want to 
focus on is what's true. Yeah. And, yeah. and when that doesn't happen every time, it doesn't make that truth any less true. Yeah, no, because that's, that's right. what you were saying before. That's the foundation. Yeah, that's the formation of what you're, you're yeah. building this it's, it's, you know, there, there's, a, there's a time for bowing. There's a time for celebrating. There's a time for repentance. There's a time for rejoicing. There's a time for reflection, time for mm-hmm. proclamation. Mm-hmm. All that's based on the truths that we're singing mm-hmm. and rooted in how God has revealed himself to us in the person and work of Christ. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's a, it, you know, it's just so big. The, the importance of feeding people with the songs we sing, because ultimately they reflect and shape what we believe and feel. Um, and I, I came across two quotes, one's by Edwards, one's by Piper, that, that talk about that. You know, songs in one way are meant to be an expression of, of what's in our hearts and minds. So this is Jonathan Edwards. I'm sorry, John Piper. He says, the reason we sing is because there are depths and heights and intensities and kinds of emotions that will not be satisfactorily expressed by mere prosaic forms or even poetic readings. Mm -hmm. There are realities that demand to break out of prose into poetry, and some demand that poetry be stretched into song. I love that. Oh, I do too. It's just so true that you cannot sing about the Son of God leaving his throne, taking on Mm -hmm. our flesh, living a perfect Mm -hmm. life, dying as our substitute, receiving God's wrath in our place, rising from the dead, ascending to his Father's right hand to intercede for us from where he's coming one day as a faithful groom for his bride and not be, oh, this is amazing. <laughs> yeah, we have to sing. But yeah. then Edwards flips that. Jonathan Edwards, American theologian, one mm, of the greatest English, ones we produced. Actually. English, okay. Jonathan Edwards was in America. Uh, before it was America. Before it was America? Yeah. This is cool. Oh, man, I'm feeling corrected right, right Americans now. like to claim him, but he's really not oh, American. Oh, no, I'm, I'm going to continue to say he's American. Uh, <laughs> anyway, he said, the duty of singing praises to God seems to be given wholly to excite and express mm. religious affections. To excite. Mm. There is no other reason why we should express ourselves to God in verse rather than in prose and with music, except that these things have a tendency to move our affections. Mm. So concentrating Mm -hmm. or being aware of how songs are meant to feed us is a means of actually encouraging faith-filled, Christ-exalting, Christ-spirit-empowered worship in people's hearts. So it expresses what's there, and then it excites what should be there. That's what singing can do. Right. Amen. Amen. Uh, We're out of time. Okay. And, uh, but let's continue this conversation. I think we should do that. (laughs) Thank you for listening to Sound Plus Doctrine, the podcast of Sovereign Grace Music. For more information, free sheet music, translations, and training resources, you can visit us at SovereignGraceMusic.org.